I mean, that's what our culture says today. I mean, we see that in singing competitions. We hear that in testimonies from contestants who will, who will say, I was bullied as a child. Isn't it amazing how many people have been bullied? And so what happens is we encourage them to, to lash out in a way of getting even so that what? The bully will feel bad because this person now is a superstar. And we see that happen in so many different sectors of society where, where instead of promoting forgiveness, instead of promoting healing, we promote retaliation. Come on, are you out there? And so, there's a man in the Bible that not much is said about. His name is Lamech. And in Genesis chapter 4, we see... Lamech mentioned. He is one of Adam's descendants. He's a perfect example of the vicious cycle that I'm talking about here this morning. We don't know much about him. There are a number of ancient legends that are found in rabbinical tradition as well as classical Jewish lore about him. But the Bible doesn't say much about him. But what it does say about him gives us a lot of information. And it says in Genesis 4 verse 23 and 24... Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. And if Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. This is a tragic passage of Scripture. Would you agree? I mean, not much is said about him, but what is said about him is enough for us to learn some valuable lessons. Lamech, as evidenced by his own confession, was a man of retaliation. In the midst of pain and as a result of pain in his life, retaliation caused lives to be cut short. Either physically or in quality, it can happen even with us. And we need to understand that. And until people and churches start more fully demonstrating the message of 1 Thessalonians 5.23, the church is going to be filled with people who live as spiritual infants instead of grown adult children. Here's what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Just make note of it. It says, Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body, hear it, be kept blameless even unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you want to be found blameless when Jesus comes? Amen. I want to be found blameless when the Lord returns. And the church, you and I, and when I say church, I'm talking about us. Say me. me. That's us. Me. We must deal with emotions in a biblical way. We must deal with hurt in a biblical way. We must deal with difficulty in a biblical way. We must find out what does God say about these things and then apply those things to our life so that rather than living in the hurt, living in the pain, we're able to rise above it. We should rise above hurt and pain. Amen. <coughs> and avoid the vicious cycle that so often takes hold of our lives. And finding ourselves as hurt people, in turn, hurting other people. Now here are some reasons, and I'm going to move through this kind of quickly because it's been a full day already, so you're going to have to listen with me in a very fast way, okay? okay? So there are some things that we need to recognize, and I think these will help you. Reasons hurt people tend to hurt people. Now, before we go through these things, you need to find which category you belong in. Are you a hurt person still dealing with difficulties and tragedies and turmoils in life, and you've never gotten over those things. You say, well, I'm not sure. Well, if you're not sure, then you're probably hurt. Amen. It's just laying dormant inside of you, and at some point, something's going to trigger that hurt to rise up. That pain is going to rise up, and it's going to lash out in some situation, some conversation in your life. We must deal with those things, even the things that are laying dormant in us. Can I get an amen? Amen. Because hurt people hurt people, and if you're a hurt person, you're eventually going to hurt somebody in some way. Or, you may be someone who has been hurt by a hurt person. Amen, amen. And the vicious cycle has 
has the potential to continue in your life if you don't forgive the people who hurt you. Amen. So we're going to deal with these things this morning. So here's some reasons hurt people tend to hurt people. First, hurt people perceive or interpret the words and actions of others through the prism of their own pain. They interpret and perceive the words and actions of others through the prism of their own pain. That's a very ugly way of interpreting people's words. It's a very nasty way of interpreting people's actions because people cannot win when you are perceiving and interpreting their words and their actions through the prism of your pain. If you have pain and difficulty in your life, it's like putting on glasses and you put those things on and you may not realize they are there, but someone says something and all of a sudden that pain is triggered and you lash out at that person when all they were saying was something very innocent. How many of you have observed that before? We per 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 perceive and our perceptions are wrong. And it creates this cycle of ongoing problem in our life and division with those who perhaps were saying things to help us. I have seen people lash out at people who are trying to help them to the point where the person trying to help backs off and says, well, you know, until they deal with some things in their life, I'm not sure what I can do for them. And there's a separation. And there's a division there. Pain is a power. Wield it over your life. And pain is a power that can push you into yourself. And the deeper you go into yourself, the further you move away from your Lord. Amen. Amen. It can cause a person to think of no one except how it affects them. This becomes a primary motivation for lashing out at others. And it's difficult to think about or feel for anything other than the difficulty you're in. When you're in pain, when there's hurt in your life, that seems to absorb your attention. It absorbs your focus and everything else. There's no peripheral vision when you're hurting. There's only that, that zero in the focus on the very thing that hurt you. And you can't think outside the box. You can't think any wider than the very hurt that you're being affected by. Are you hearing me this morning? Amen. Hurting people are most often unaware that they are hurting others when they falsely perceive the words and actions of the others. And in an effort to do something about their pain, what they do is they simply transfer it to the others, causing additional hurt. And there again goes the cycle that never ends. The hurt that people feel and hang on to is in part due, here it is, to their unwillingness to forgive. When one is unwilling to forgive, the hurt they feel becomes a cancer that eats away in their heart. Some of you have gone through that in your life. Some of you are going through it in your life right now. And others of you, I hope, will avoid that by listening to this message so you won't have to go through it in the future. Amen. So we need to be people who are willing to forgive immediately when something comes and tries to hurt you. Amen. If we don't forgive, we are at a disability. We have a disadvantage in our life. It disables us from love. It disables us from care. It disables us from concern. And most of all, it disables us from wisdom to deal with life in a meaningful way. When you deal in your hurt, when you allow your hurt to overwhelm you, when you allow your pain to, to occupy all the space and energy of your life, there is no way for you to have the kind of wisdom you need to navigate life. Amen. You're robbed of that very thing. You're not able to love like you want to love. You're not able to care like you want to care. You're not able to show concern. John 20 verse 23 says, If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. Say amen. amen. But we must read on. Because the second part of that verse says, If you retain the sins of any, they then are retained. In other words, they... They, they keep hold of those things, but more than that, you keep hold of them. Hurt people hurt people because they perceive and interpret words and actions through the prism of their own pain. So can we agree today that we're not going to do that? 
Come on, nod your head. Everybody in this building has been hurt at some point in your life by somebody or some situation or some circumstance. So all of us, this message is for, including yours truly. You would think, oh, you're a pastor. Pastors never get hurt. <laughs> oh, boy, do I have some swamp land for you? For sale. We've all been hurt. The question is not, have we been hurt? The question is, how do we deal with the hurt and the pain that comes in our life? And so today we must make a, a very focused a response to the Lord by saying, I am not gonna, I'm not gonna listen to people through the lens of my hurt. I'm not gonna listen through the prism of my pain, but rather I'm gonna give people the benefit of the doubt. Can we do that? Amen. Secondly, hurt people isolate themselves in their hurt and they blame others for not reaching out. I'm gonna say it again. Hurt people isolate themselves in their hurt, in their pain, and they blame others for not reaching out. That's a most dangerous phenomenon. And I've seen this time and time again in ministry over the years, is that people isolate themselves when they're in pain, and then they blame others for not caring. Why didn't you call me? Why didn't you do the what? It's like, what? You isolated yourself. You're the one that disappeared. We couldn't find you. I put you on my GPS. <laughs> and even my GPS couldn't find you. But there's a blame game that goes on. They hide away in their pain. And it's usually because of guilt. I, I, you know, I've been in this a long time. I know I don't look that old. I know I look fresh, young, energetic. Handsome. See what I don't know. But the bottom line, I've been around a while. And I've learned people. You know, when you've been around people for a long time, you learn people, don't you? And I can tell when there's sin in somebody's life. You know how I know that? They disappear. They isolate themselves. But the same is true with hurt. And hurt, we're going to find out in just a few moments, doesn't necessarily mean there's sin in your life, but hurt can become a sin in your life if you withdraw from the help that God provides for you. And I've seen this time and time again, how isolation becomes the very thing that we run to in our lives. But then our pain lashes out. To those who do want to help us, who do care about us, who do love us. And even if people have tried to reach out, we don't see it. Why? Because we're perceiving what they're doing through the prism of our pain. Their words and their actions. We, we feel like there's something suspicious about why they're wanting to reach out to me. Because when people are living in their hurt, when they're living in their pain, they're suspicious people. They think everybody has uh, something against them or, or, or has an agenda against you. When in reality, people are really just trying to help you and love you and care for you and bring you back to the place you ought to be. Can I get an amen? But isolation is where we run to when we're hurt many times. And it pushes those who can actually help us away. And it's all because of several other what I would call sub-points if you're writing these things down. I think they're in your notes, but just comment this item if something touches your heart. For example, we have false expectations on situations and on people. When we expect people to live a certain way or do a certain thing and they do not come through, we can easily be hurt if we do not have a healthy view of ourselves and God and a forgiving spirit towards others. Did you hear that? A healthy view of ourselves and God and a forgiving spirit towards others. I believe that those two things will help you prosper in your life. A healthy view of who you are in Christ and a forgiving spirit towards others. If you just master those two things, I believe you can avoid hurt and pain in your life. But our problem is, is we put expectations, false expectations on people and on situations. And when we think we deserve more than we do, then we set ourselves up for hurt. You know, the Bible says, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. 
You know, the world would say, oh, you're special, you're all that, and, and you're wonderful, and you're good, and you're great, and you're this, and you're that. And then when someone doesn't see things the same way, our expectations are burst. And we think everybody hates us now because we've set ourselves up by the culture of this world in such a way so as to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. You know what we are? Is we're depraved sinners. That's what we are. You say, wait a minute, I'm saved and born again. Okay, then you're a saved, born again, depraved sinner. <laughs> as long as you live in this life, you're, you're going to be susceptible to sin in your life because none of you are perfect. So the sooner we can recognize really who we are in the core of, of our being, but it's only Him that makes anything of us. It is only Jesus in my life that makes me capable of rising above what I would naturally do on my own. It is His grace that empowers me to do what I cannot do in my natural ability. Are you out there? Yeah. This is the power of, of Christ in me. This is the power of the Holy Spirit in me. But it is, I have no power whatsoever to do good. And so we must see ourselves in Christ the way we should and therefore have a forgiving spirit towards everyone else in our life. So don't have a false ex expectation on situations and people. Secondly, we fail to understand spiritual covering in our life. We fail to understand spiritual covering. We many times... Hear this, put ourselves in situations and in relationships without seeking godly and right kind of counsel. We tend to want counsel from those who will tell us what we want to hear. We want to seek counsel for those who think just like us. Listen, I, I, I read books that I don't agree with. You say, how dare you, you're a pastor. You're going to be deceived and you're going to start preaching heresy. No, because I know the Word of God. And what I want to do, though, is I want to know what the enemy is saying. But I don't take the enemy's counsel. What I do is I'm just aware of where he's messed up and where the world's messed up so that I can then go to the Word of God and see clearly what the Word of God says for me. Amen? Amen. And, and we tend to, to want to get counsel. We want to get covering from our peers or, or for someone who thinks just like us. Sometimes we have to make sure that we're getting someone who's godly because I may not always be thinking right. Come on, you too. I'm not always thinking right. And so we, we want to seek people who live according not to their own whims, but according to the Word of God. As best as we can identify that and as best as we know their heart and the fruit of their life. And then when things go awry, we're hurt. Because again, sometimes we can seek counsel from the wrong people. We can put ourselves under the wrong people and we're hurt. We blame those who could actually have helped us. And we blame those who want to be our covering or those who are supposed to be our covering. And so what happens is we could have avoided the hurt. We could have avoided the pain. We could have avoided the situation if we had sought them out and entered in to covenant as opposed to entering into a situation on our own. Let me tell you something. Don't enter into situations on your own. God has put people in your life. He's put a family in your life. He's put a church in your life. He's put elders in your life. He's put spiritual people in your life. Can I get a witness? Yeah. And sometimes we want to do things on our own because of pride. And yet God says, submit things to those who are wise. Submit things to those who are godly. And let them guide you and help you in making the kind of decisions that will help you avoid the pain and the hurt and the problems in your life. But see, we don't value the church anymore like we once did. We don't see the spiritual covering as God intended for it to be. And it doesn't mean that you have people in your life telling you what to do, but people who love you enough to tell you what you need to hear when you need to hear it. Yes. So you say, well, how do, I, how do I know who those people are? Well, here's some characteristics for you. First of all, it's somebody who has some knowledge. Proverbs 24.4 talks about that. Why spiritual covering is knowledgeable about the Word of God? <laughs> First and foremost, if it's not according to the Word of God, I don't care what you have to say. Amen. Amen. Don't come with the latest, greatest Word. 
that you heard from Joe Blow, the, the super apostle and prophetic voice. That's right. I believe the prophetic, but I believe the prophetic in the context of God's Word. Not according to what we're thinking that word should be. Okay? Or, or that, that word lines up with what I think already, and therefore it must be a word from God. Well, what if you're thinking wrong and that word lines up with your thinking? It might be from the devil. Am I getting too personal? Let me get more personal. Wisdom. Someone who walks in wisdom. Someone who has a proven track record in their life of exercising the wisdom of God in their life. Why spiritual counseling uh, or covering applies the knowledge of God's Word in their everyday interaction with family, with friends, even with strangers. Their lives are marked with a seasoning of careful reasoning and understanding. It's one thing to have knowledge. It's another thing to, to know how to handle the knowledge that you have. The definition of wisdom. Wisdom is the proper handling of the knowledge of God's Word. That's the wisdom of God. We can handle the knowledge of God in a proper way. But so many Christians today, they have a lot of knowledge. They're smart people. But they don't have a whole lot of wisdom because they don't manage the knowledge they have according to the way God wants it to be managed. Those are the ones that we need to help. Thirdly, experience. Why spiritual covering must have life experiences that have proven their own perseverance in the faith. Resist following after the advice of new converts or novices who need to be more mature in the faith. Amen? Just because you have a lifelong friend doesn't make that lifelong friend an expert in what you need. Rely on them to support you and encourage you as a friend, but when it comes to certain specific issues in your life that you are having to make decisions about, find somebody who's smarter than your friend. Not even smarter, more godly, or more spiritually knowledgeable and wise than your friend. You say, my friend is very spiritual, very wise. Okay. But your friend also may very well find in your favor simply because they're your friend. We also need to find people in our life to tell us what we don't want to hear sometimes. Someone who will love us enough to speak the truth in love. Amen? Amen. Four, discernment. Wise spiritual covering discerns what is good through the Scriptures and through prayer. The Holy Spirit gives insight and direction through those who've submitted their lives to Christ and to His Word. Say His Word. His word. I, will, I can never overemphasize His Word. His Word. Truthfulness. I've referred to it already, but why spiritual covering will speak the hard truth to you in love. They want you to live righteously and avoid the pitfalls of ignorance. Compassion. Why spiritual covering is marked by agape love and compassion for God's people. I hope you hear love in this message today. Not anger and not resentment and not fury. But I, I'm passionate. I'm so in love with you. I want you to be able to prosper in your life. Yeah. And I want you to rise above your hurt. And I want you to rise above your pain. And I want you to rise above a, a, a misunderstanding of what, what you think is God. when sometimes it's not. I love you enough. To know that this is something going on in all of our lives from time to time. Listen, there are times when I'm confused. Amen. <laughs> and I have to get counsel. I'm not in counseling, but I get counsel. I'm not in therapy or anything like that, but I get counsel. I have wise, older, seasoned, experienced men of God in my life that I can go to and say, man, I am... I'm against the wall. I don't really know what I should do here. I'm confused. And, and sometimes they tell me things I don't want to hear. Because even in our confusion, we have an idea of what we think we want to do. But sometimes it doesn't feel right. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is not allowing it to feel right. And so we have to seek counsel. And then counsel says, well, that's not what you're supposed to do anyway. I didn't want you to say that to me. I was wanting you, to, you know, to encourage me to do what I thought I should do. We need people 
to speak into our life with truthfulness and with compassion and with integrity and those who have a reputation of some measure of success. Come on. I'm not going to go to a, to a heart doctor when the last 500 people has died on the operating table. Come on. I'm going to find somebody that has a pretty good life expectancy rate. They have a reputation. <laughs> and so it's important for us to understand that hurt people isolate themselves in their hurt, blame others for not reaching out, and oftentimes it's because they do not understand spiritual covering. Third, and I'm moving towards the last, hurt people will intentionally busy themselves in an effort to forget their pain. I've watched people who've been hurt harbor that hurt to the point that it becomes sin. I, I alluded to this earlier. Being hurt is not a sin. Let me say that very clearly. Is everybody okay? Yes. Being hurt is not a sin. But hanging on to it and allowing it to negatively affect your life and your behavior is. I've witnessed many who in an effort not to deal with it will busy themselves in order to either try and forget it or simply brush it under the carpet for safekeeping. Now that sounds strange, doesn't it? That sounds odd to keep it for safekeeping, but many will embrace their pain and they will keep pain and hurt as a, as a shield or a weapon. So they busy themselves and they guard themselves. And this fabricated effort to forget pain will only lead to frustration it will lead to exhaustion. It will lead to tension in relationships if you don't deal with it and let God deal with it in your own heart. We all need to realize that hurt is inevitable. The goal ought to be that the hurtful mess in our lives should become our healing message to other people. You can be a testimony and a witness to the grace of God in your life when you rise above your hurt, your pain, and forgive others and not allow that vicious cycle to happen in your life. Can I get an amen? The goal ought to be that the hurtful mess in our lives should become a healing message. When we are wounded, our pride is empowered and many times takes advantage of the moment with desire to get even. Again, it is about retaliation in so many people's lives. Even though they don't realize that's what they're doing, they're retaliating for the pain and the hurt. So in conclusion, these points that I have made about hurt people hurting people are warning signs when we get into the difficulties of life. The questions are these. How does a hurting person overcome hurt with good? How does one get free from anger and bitterness? If you are hurt and experiencing the pain of trial, here are some things that you should do to deal with your pain in a Christian way. They're in your notes, but I'm going to call them to your attention as we close this message. Number one. Remember that you have not suffered first, nor have you suffered most. You're not the first one to go through hurt and pain. And, and you haven't suffered nearly as much as someone else has. And yet, when we're hurt and we're in pain, we think the world evolves or revolves around us, don't we? Well, it does if you're selfish. It does if you're prideful. And so we've got to We've got to confess that pride and selfishness and we've got to repent of that and let God soften our heart and open up our mind to the reality of who Christ is in us. Number two, acknowledge that your feelings are real, but so are others. It's okay to say I'm hurt. But you also need to understand that that hurt cannot be the catalyst for you to hurt other people. And so acknowledge, yes, I'm a hurt, but other people have hearts and and other people have feelings, and other people have emotions, and other people have hurts as well. And so rather than using my hurt to compound the hurt, I want to I want to recognize my hurt and deal with my hurt in such a way so as I can help others not hurt. Amen. Number three, be careful not to magnify your hurt. Because sometimes what happens is as we magnify our hurt, we embellish our hurt. And our hurt becomes much more than the original hurt that hurt. Did you get that? It'll be on tape because I can't say it again. 
But don't magnify your hurt. Don't embellish your hurt. Don't build it up to some monstrosity that never was that hurt in the first place. Number four, don't dwell on your pain. Focus on Christ in your pain. I've been around so many people and, and, and I see them coming. I don't want to run the other way. Because I know it's, it's like, what, what's that character, Eeyore? <laughs> uh, everything's so bad. Everything's bad and not good. Well, it was me. I think I'll go to, my grandmother used to say, if I didn't hug her neck, I'm going to go to the other end of the world and eat worms. <laughs> And something that y'all said when you were young, but I never heard that before. <laughs> it's like you see those people who are negative just because they're dwelling on their pain, they're dwelling on their hurt. They have no joy in life. They have no, no celebrational ways of experiencing life. But we can help those people. About this being positive and speaking the word of the Lord into their life and speaking joy on them and, and speaking life on them. You know, we need to be a people who speak life, not death. But don't dwell on your pain. Again, admit it, I'm hurt, but, but also recognize that there's a power that God has given you by His Spirit that lives on the inside of you, if you're a Christian, to overcome that pain so that you don't have to dwell on it. I dwell on the goodness of the Lord. I appreciate Job so much in the Bible. No one was hurt like Job was hurt. No one had pain like Job had pain. But Job kept saying, listen, when his friends would come and tell him what he needed to do, he would, it was almost like Job wanted to say, get out of my life, man. You guys are depressing. <laughs> And these guys had it made. Job's the one going through the pain. They're trying to counsel him. He's saying, man, blessed be the name of the Lord God. I came into this world naked. I'm going to leave naked. And I'm just going to enjoy the journey in between. Hopefully with some clothes on. So don't dwell on your pain. Focus on Christ in the midst of your pain. And then fifth, involve God in your daily decisions. Don't, don't try to make decisions on your own and then inform God later. Come on, that's what we do with spiritual covering. Right? When God puts spiritual covering in your life to help you with decisions, but we make decisions and then we inform people. Just like we do with God. You say, well, I don't know that I do that. Here's, here's how we do it. We arrange our lives, we fix our lives, and then we pray God bless what we've done. Right? We don't ask God what we should do. We do what we do and then we ask God, will you bless this Lord? Lord's saying, I'm not going to bless what I wasn't involved in. Come on. I'm going to say it again. God will not bless what He wasn't involved in. He will only bless what He does. Therefore, we must submit our lives to God, surrender to His work in our life, and then He'll bless what it is that we do in accordance with His Word and in accordance with His will. So involve God in your daily decisions. Amen? Amen. So we need to prayerfully confront and confess inner feelings of anger and then surrender them to the loving healing of our Heavenly Father. God calls us first to confront our own feelings openly and honestly. Here's a Bible verse. One another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Hebrews says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many become defiled. Do you hear that? If you let bitterness root in your heart, it will not only devastate your life, but it will devastate the lives of other people. And that is what we're talking about today. Hurt people hurt people. But we refuse to be hurt people who hurt people. If we're hurt, we want to see healing come to our own lives, to the lives of others. And we want everyone that we come into contact to prosper in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you bow your heads, please?